And um, welcome to the third talk in uh, the first session for today. Um, we're here with Shauna Gordon McKeon, and she's talking to us about open source for newcomers and for the people who want to welcome them. Now, um, Shauna, Go Shauna is the uh, lead developer for Rapid. Rapid Science, and she's also the director of the Open Source Compass Campus and Open Hatch's program director. So, um, thank you very much, Shauna. Thank you, Elena. Uh, so, before we get started, I just want to point out at the bottom of the slide is a short link uh, to where these slides are hosted online, um, and you can use them, use that link to follow along now or to check out the slides later. A lot of the slides have links to projects I'm referencing, resources I'm recommending, so they're a good resource. A little bit about me. Uh, I am a consultant and a contract developer. I develop software, I develop event series, I develop research projects. Um, here are just a few of the organizations that I work with and volunteer for. Um, most relevant to this talk, though, is the work that I do with Open Hatch, uh, directing Open Source Comes to Campus. And Open Source Comes to Campus is an event series. We've held over 50 events on college campuses around the United States and one in Canada, uh, where we introduce students to free and open source software. And a typical event is a day long. We do tutorials in the morning, talk about what, what open source is, uh, what open source culture is like, tools like uh, issue trackers, version control, mailing lists, IRC. Uh, we do career panels, give people a sense of if they want to contribute to open source, what are the different paths they can take, what are the ways they can get supported. Um, and we also have, in the afternoons, we finish off with what we call our contributions workshop, where students get started making their contributions to projects, uh, frequently with mentors at the events who uh, contribute to or maintain their own projects, um, as well as projects that we recommend from the community. Um, and this is always a lot of fun. There's always a ton of volunteers, both the students volunteering their time and the mentors who are there. Uh, lots of enthusiasm and excitement and a lot of obstacles. Um, so this talk is going to be about those obstacles and it's for both newcomers and people who have open source projects that they want to make more welcoming to newcomers. Because um, a lot of the issues can be addressed from both sides, both in terms of letting newcomers know about some of the obstacles that exist and ways to get around them and to help maintainers uh, address some issues that might be presenting problems to people trying to contribute to their projects. Um, I'm going to focus on four things, how people pick projects, how they find that first task to, to, get, to get involved, how you can find time to contribute to open source, um, and how you can feel like you belong. So I'm going to get right started. So there are a lot of open source projects out there. Uh, depending on how you count, you could say that there are hundreds of thousands of open source projects. If you want to be more conservative and say an open source project is something that's active and has at least two contributors, which is not actually a definition I go for, but if you want to be more conservative, there's still tens of thousands of open source projects out there. So where do you even begin when it comes to finding just one or just a couple to contribute to? It can be really overwhelming. Uh, so for uh, the first thing I recommend is knowing yourself. And so for newcomers, that means asking yourself some questions. Uh, why is it that you want to contribute? Uh, what kind of things do you like to do? Uh, what skills do you have? Um, what projects do you know about already and are excited about or have friends that contribute to? Um, and you can use these answers in your search to help find projects. Um, and you can share that knowledge as you approach projects. Um, so for instance, if you wanted to contribute to Django, you could say, you know, I'm pretty new. I've gone through the tutorial. And what I really want to is to understand more about Django. Like, that's my goal here. Um, or for instance, if you're a visual learner, you could say, um, one thing I'd love to do, since I learned so well from visual documentation, is to help you develop some visual documentation. You know, do you think we could work on that together? Is that something your project would like? Um, maintainers need to ask these questions of themselves, too. Uh, what communities do you want to build? Uh, do you want to just grow and grow and grow and have a lot of people? Or are you interested in having a more tight-knit community? Um, what are your weaknesses and strengths? How much time and energy do you have? Because everyone's got a finite amount of time that they can devote to these things. Um, and you can share that knowledge, too, with newcomers uh, in your conversations with them, as well as in your documentation and your publicity outreach. Um, a great example of a project that uh, is very explicit about their 
uh, what they're looking for is open edX. And they have a section of their getting started contributing guide that talks about the expectations that they have of people who are coming to the project, as well as the expectations that people can have of them. And so, for instance, one thing they talk about is that uh, they want to, uh, they promise to try and respond within a week. Um, and they also expect that if they're leaving comments on a pull request, for instance, that uh, users respond within a week. And that's the time frame that they expect. And if you can't meet it, that's OK. They'll welcome you coming back later, but they're going to close it and move on if there's no, no change in a week. Uh, so that's a great example of being explicit about what they're looking for. Um, it's totally OK to have preferences. It doesn't make you ungrateful. It doesn't make you picky. Uh, I had a conversation recently with someone who was starting up a new project. Um, and she was getting a lot of offers for people to help her, uh, people who wanted to, to help code her project. And she felt really bad about this because the project was still in a design stage and wasn't ready for coders. Um, and I talked to her and I said, you don't have to, like, what is, what, is, what is your task right now? What are you working on? She said, well, we're in the design phase. I need to talk to potential users, get a sense of what is going to be uh, good for them in terms of the product, and then I need to like, sit down and make uh, like a product plan. So you can ask for that from contributors. And if the contributors can't do that, you can say, well, why don't you check back again later? In the meantime, here are some other projects that might be looking for coding contributions. And that's like a great outcome. You do not have to personally field all of the contributors. Um, and she said it felt very validating. Um, and so I hope to spread that message that you do not need to be the, 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 the home for all new contributors. Um, once you've gotten that step out of the way, the next step is evaluating projects. And so when you're evaluating a project that's like from the newcomer perspective, but uh, maintainers, can, uh, maintainers can get a sense of what uh, newcomers might be looking at and keep an eye on those things. So the three things that uh, I recommend looking for are activity, responsiveness, and culture. Um, so jumping right in. Activity uh, can be measured by a number of things. Uh, how often issues get reported in the issue tracker, uh, the commit history, when was the last commit merged, how busy is the IRC channel and the mailing list. Um, so I have a few examples of different projects. Uh, Django, for instance, is very active. They have over 1,000 open tickets, um, which sounds bad until you see just how many closed tickets they have. Uh, they have over 500 people in their IRC channel, dozens of open pull requests, very, very busy. Um, so if you're someone who likes a really active community and likes feeling like a whatever sized fish in a very large pond, uh, Django is a great option, option for you. Um, I picked a kind of random uh, Django package. So Django Braces has a couple of commits a month, a half dozen open pull requests, no IRC channel. It's a much smaller community, and it might be a better fit for someone who wants to be wants to be able to wrap their head around a whole project, wants to know everyone uh, who is involved in committing to the project. Um, and then we also ask people to watch out for inactive projects. Um, so I, again, I picked a random project that is, I found that was inactive, uh, Django tagging. Uh, their last commit is five years ago. If a project's last commit is five years ago, you probably don't want to try and contribute because it will probably just You'll submit a pull request or send a patch, and it'll just sit there forever. Um, so unless it's an entirely academic exercise for you that you want to do pretty much on your own, uh, don't recommend an inactive project. Um, but exploring the repository actually shows that the project is still active just somewhere else, um, and it's got new ownership. So um, it's always worthwhile to do a little bit of poking around if you are interested in a project. Um, so the rules of thumb that we tell the students at our events, and I'm telling you now, uh, Check for one or more commits in the last two months, or pull requests, issues reported, uh, replies to issues, not just issues reported. Um, there's no harm in asking if the project's still active. Um, you know, worst response is no response, which you're not going to get, which you'll get no response if you don't ask to begin with. Um, and you know, more activity isn't always better. Uh, this for maintainers as well as for students. Like a small project could be a great fit for you. Um, moving on to responsiveness, uh, so uh, do community members respond to issues that are left in the issue tracker? Um, and this one's really important to me. Do maintainers give feedback on pull requests when they need changes, or do they just kind of get left there? Um, or when people ask for help on mailing lists or IRC, are there responses? These are all things that are really important in a, in a, in a, 
first project for a newcomer. Um, a great example of this is SciPy. I had a wonderful experience with SciPy uh, a year, a year and a half ago when I wanted to contribute and I found a bite-sized bug and I worked on it and uh, I must have submitted that pull request five or six times because each time there was some important change that needed to be made and each time the maintainers walked me through uh, what it was that I had done wrong and uh, how to fix it and I learned, I learned a whole bunch uh, from doing that, um, and so I highly recommend SciPy. And you can see from the screenshot on the right-hand side, uh, there's a list uh, or a, a count of comments on each pull request. And you can see that uh, virtually every pull request in SciPy gets a comment, many get a lot. Um, you can also see on the left-hand side, they have um, the little icon is colored, and when it's purple, it means it's a merged pull request. So uh, SciPy merges a lot of their pull requests. They're willing to work hard with contributors to get that pull request merged. And actually, I clicked some of the ones that were marked red, and frequently, the change was merged just in a different pull request. So great community. Um, and so, uh, um, and then finally, culture. Um, and this one's a little bit harder. It's not like you can go into, a, um, into an issue tracker and count the number of comments on a thread or look in the commit history and see, oh, there's been four in the last days. It's not as easily quantifiable, but it's just as important, if not more important. Um, Asking yourself, how are users with questions treated? Uh, how are newcomers treated? Uh, does the community have a code of conduct? Um, which may or may not be important to you, but is important to me. Um, so a great example of a code of conduct is uh, from Kamir. Um, and one thing I'd like to point out about it is that in addition to explaining what behavior is uh, acceptable or not acceptable, um, it gives a clear way for you to report violations of the code of conduct, including if violations of the code of conduct or issues are found with the people you're supposed to be reporting to, there's a secondary person to report to. So this is, a, what, in my opinion, a great code of conduct. Um, uh, another sort of cultural example I'm gonna take from us, uh, a little self-serving. Uh, so in Open Hatch, I noticed that newcomers to our IRC channel were having a bit of trouble. A lot of people, uh, because we do so much outreach and because we are introducing people to IRC, at our events and through our websites, a lot of people who come to our channel are using IRC for the first time, and they maybe don't understand uh, you know, all of the technical and cultural um, norms. So for instance, people will come in, say hello, and no one responds within 20 seconds. They'll be like, oh, I guess there's no one here. Or maybe they're ignoring me because there's, you know, it says there's 90 people in the channel, and no one said hi, um, and they'll leave. Um, so I created a bot that detects when there's a completely new nickname in the channel and says hello. Um, and it gives a bit of a, a pause so that if there is an active discussion going on, the people who are actually looking at the channel can uh, say hello. Um, and uh, it also pings uh, active members of the community who may be at their computer but not checking IRC, so they don't know that someone's entered. Um, and so I'm not saying that, you know, in order to be a welcoming project, you have to have a welcome bot, but just that things like this can be signs of uh, a sort of caring community. Um, another thing uh, from this screenshot that I think is interesting is just a, a, a little bit later, someone uh, links to a pull request, or sorry, a um, patch submission to the Linux kernel mailing list, uh, and the submission is from someone on behalf of their four-year-old. Um, so it's adorable. Um, I can actually read it. It said, the last, that letter, the less, last S, is sad because all the others have those things below them and it does not, and some quotes. Uh, this patch fixes that tragedy so all the letters can be happy again. Uh, signed off by, uh, the author being four years old needed some assistance. Um, and, you know, this is, this is actually an interesting lesson because uh, reading only this, you might think, oh man, that Linux kernel mailing list, one of the, that must be the most accepting, uh, friendliest, uh, tolerant open source communities there is. Um, and the truth is that there are some really wonderfully accepting, friendly, tolerant people in the mailing list. And you might find that you have a great experience or you might have a lot of problems with it. And there's no magic way to, to uh, know ahead of time. You just kind of have to, uh, poke around, recognize that certain cultural issues are important to you, uh, and uh, make connections so that you can navigate it. 
Great, so that's the finding a project section. Moving on to the next section, good first tasks. Um, so, so there's an issue tracker uh, can be pretty intimidating if you've never worked uh, on a project, an open source project before. Um, a lot of issues don't have a lot of information in them. Um, a lot of them assume a lot of knowledge about uh, how the project runs and how the tools that the project uses run. Um, and so we have some suggestions for how to make finding and uh, uh, completing that first task uh, better, a better experience. So the first option, and I think the best option, is to have a mentored task. Um, so if you're up for it, label tasks in your tracker as mentored, or create a spreadsheet or a wiki or an etherpad that lists tasks where there's a person who's interested in working with someone new together on a task. Um, I highly recommend pairing. Um, it can be done at person um, through meetups and sprints or remotely with uh, something like screen sharing. Um, and it can be a mentored pair with an experienced person and a newcomer, or it can be two people who don't really know what's going on working on it together, and that can still be pretty great. Um, I really enjoy pairing. Um, but it doesn't have to be a pairing experience for it to be a mentored task. You can do it asynchronously via email or IRC or comments on the issue tracker. But just having a specific person who's there to answer your questions and to help you can be just a, a huge help for a newcomer. Uh, another option is what I like to call newcomer tasks. Uh, and these are tasks that newcomers are uniquely suited to do, that they have, uh, I like to think of them as newcomer superpowers for. Um, so the first one, I'm going to tell a little bit of a story. Um, a while back, we did an event at Purdue University. Um, and we were still, this was early on, somewhat early on in open source comes to campus. And we, there were a lot of kinks we hadn't worked out yet. Um, and so during our contributions workshop, which was something like two and a half or three hours long, uh, we had students break up and start working on trying to contribute to projects. And we had one group that spent the entire time trying to set up the development environment two and a half hours setting up the development environment. Um, we asked for feedback from everyone, as we do with most of our events. Uh, and the obstacles that they faced, in their own words, were lots of downloads, a need to improve account, had to create our own database on localhost, tears clouding vision. Um, and they actually had a great sense of humor about it and really enjoyed um, the experience. But not everyone really enjoys two and a half hours of confusing development environment setup. I personally don't really. Uh, and there's a happy ending to the story. Um, so the project they were working on was Privly. Uh, and we wrote about it. And Privly was motivated to do an epic document sprint where they um, opened uh, something like 25 issues in their documentation and closed them and like really drastically improved their uh, getting started process. And that inspired us uh, to develop setup sprints. Um, and these are when you take at least one newcomer and at least one maintainer. And they go through the setup process together in real time. Um, this can be remotely via something like IRC, or it can be in person at an event like a sprint. Um, and this process unearths confusing language, uh, missing steps, unknown dependencies, all the sorts of things that the core developers of projects are going to miss because you know, they set this up months or years ago, and they haven't, uh, they, they haven't thought about them since they didn't think to put them in the documentation when they wrote the documentation. Um, or they're things that are on different platforms than the ones they're using. Um, we've written down a lot of uh, sort of general advice in our handbook, which is linked there. Uh, but um, the, the process of doing a setup sprint is a great first, uh, first task for a newcomer. And in fact, the more they do with your project, the less suited they are to do this task. So it's a, it's a great first choice. Uh, another option is something called a think aloud. It's used in user testing. Um, again, you need one maintainer and one newcomer. Um, this one's generally better done one-on-one. -on -one. The setup sprints, in fact, can work really well in a group setting. Um, the maintainer gives the newcomer a goal or a task, or just gives them a thing and asks them to figure out, you know, what does it do? Just try to use it. Um, and the newcomer will speak their thoughts as they interact. And it unearths a lot of assumptions and a lot of confusions um, that developers and designers uh, might not uh, come up with on their own because having built the thing, they just assume that certain things are just how you, that's clearly how you use it. Um, and the maintainer is not supposed to uh, get too involved. They're there to ask clarifying questions or if the 
you, or the person doing the think aloud is, um, you know, kind of stalled or stops talking and just looks be like bem bemused or befuddled, um, then they can say, you know, what are you thinking? Um, so it's another, another, uh, it's another task that actually gets less suited for someone the more they participate in the project. So again, it's another good task. Uh, there are additional uh, tasks that are also friendly for newcomers, um, but uh, they're not, you, anyone can do them, um, but they are especially accessible. Um, so one is reproducing bugs in the issue tracker. Um, it's a great way to really significantly help the development team, um, as well as to get to know the project. Um, another thing is there are many projects that have sort of, um, uh, they have project websites that are sort of secondary to the project itself, um, and don't, they're not paying a lot of attention to the accessibility of the site. And there's some great tools online that people can use to detect when a site is not accessible, for instance, to screen readers, and to make those changes. And because these websites are typically in HTML, um, it's less of a you know, massive code-based setup issue to go in and fix them. Uh, the third option is bite-sized tasks. Uh, people call these you know, uh, beginner tasks, starter tasks. Um, edX over there has uh, bite-sized tasks with a B-Y-T-E, which I thought was cute. Um, because everyone uses different terms, it's not, you don't really want to um, look for a specific term so much as scroll through the labels for the one that, uh, for one that looks like it's aimed for newcomers. Um, the problem with bite-sized tasks, though, is that not everything that gets labeled as a bite-sized task is a bite-sized task. There are, in fact, some tasks that get labeled as bite-sized and then hang around in issue trackers for a long time as people try to work on them, fail, and you know, move on. Um, and there's really very little that's more demoralizing than be given something that's specifically made to be easy and then failing utterly at it because it's really, really hard, secretly. Um, so you want to be careful with bite-sized tasks, um, which is why I recommend pairing them with, say, a mentor. Um, but another thing you can do if you want to make sure that your, uh, tasks, your, your tasks are more suitable for newcomers is in addition to label them bite size, also make sure that they have important information for, uh, for newcomers. So for instance, uh, the skills needed and tools needed to complete the task, uh, where they might want to make the change in your code base, especially if it's a large or complicated code base, um, links to relevant documentation, um, members of the community who might be able to help or give feedback. Um, and this is a lot of information to provide on any single issue. Um, the vast majority of projects, including most of Open Hatch's projects, uh, when an issue gets, first gets reported, it's actually pretty minimalist. Um, in spite of the best practices, it, this is a fair amount of information to provide. Um, so I'm not saying you should just go through your entire issue tracker and provide all this information for anything. but. If you're going to be labeling something for newcomers, taking a little bit of time to make sure that they have that extra information is key. Um, and if you're a newcomer, these are, and you're getting stuck, these are maybe some of the pieces of information that you're missing. Um, and it's totally OK to ask. Uh, ask for help figuring out where to make the change. Um, ask if there's a tool uh, or dependency that maybe you're missing. Uh, and I have an example from Open Hatch here. It was actually. Uh, somewhat hard to find something like this because we don't do a great job of eating our own dog food uh, in this case. Um, because, again, the default mode when reporting an issue, I think, for a lot of projects is to just get it down there so you don't forget, uh, which is fine, but it's important to go back and, and add that information. Uh, the next thing is finding time. So uh, you can get support to work on free and open source software. Um, for students with who we work with a lot, um, you can ask your professors about getting credit for your uh, open source work. Um, there are more and more schools that are beginning to incorporate open source into their curriculum, including RIT, which has the first open source minor. Um, you can also apply for internships, fellowships, grants. So we keep a list of paid opportunities to work in open source uh, exclusive of jobs. Um, so things like Google Summer of Code or Outreachy, uh, Wikimedia grants, et cetera. Um, think about your schedule. Think about uh, what the particular demands on your time are. Um, if you can contribute here and there indefinitely, finding projects with uh, you know, 
low activity, you don't have to spend a lot of time to keep up with development, um, or you know, short, discrete tasks can be a good fit. If you, you, know, you have a weekend here, they're like a big chunk of time to put together, you could go to a hackathon um, or a sprint. If you have a few months where you could consider applying for an internship. Um, what's important here is communication. Uh, if you um, have limitations, that's totally fine, but just be explicit about them so that you can work well with your, uh, uh, in the process. So saying things like, you know, I'm really sorry I haven't gotten to your uh, pull request. I want to look at it next week. If I haven't, please poke me. Um, I'm just really busy right now. Um, that's the kind of communication that makes someone feel included and respected and helps them uh, understand when um, People, people are forgiving. They understand that you're a busy person. Um, and so having that kind of communication uh, enables you to work at the time scale that, that works for you um, without people dropping out because they think that they're just being ignored. Um, maintainers, you can multiply your, multiply your efforts by empowering newcomers to help other newcomers. Um, we've definitely had the experience in the Open Hatch IRC channel of welcoming a newcomer into the channel and within days or even hours having them turn around and welcome other newcomers in the same way that they've been welcomed. So um, if you empower people to do that, you can take a little, bit of, um, a little bit of the load off welcoming people off of yourself. Um, and so the final section is feeling like you belong, um, which can be surprisingly difficult. Um, one of the big issues that a lot of people face is imposter syndrome. Uh, Julie Pagano gave an excellent talk on imposter syndrome at last year's PyCon. Uh, that link there goes to uh, that talk. Um, and imposter syndrome is when you feel as though you're a fraud, um, as though you can't possibly uh, belong with these other, in this case, you know, these other cool open source contributors are hacking on all these things. Um, and these are really valid feelings to have. A lot of people feel them, um, and it doesn't, you know, make you uh, bad person to feel them, but at the same time, I don't want you to feel them because I want you to feel happy and like you belong. Um, and so what are ways that we can foster feelings of belongingness and feelings of uh, whatever the, uh, the opposite of imposter is? Um, for newcomers, I recommend focusing on values. The Ada Initiative does an imposter syndrome training, uh, which is all about values. Um, and what that does is it helps you connect to the things that you have in common with the rest of the community. You might feel uncertain about your skill set, your experience, but if you focus on your values, you'll know that you're just the same as, as the other people who are contributing. Uh, there's a great project um, called What Open Source Means to Me, where people talk about why they contribute to open source, and there's a lot of focus on values there. Um, and so uh, if you're feeling like an imposter, I recommend reading through that in addition to potentially doing the eight initiatives. Um, training. Uh, for maintainers, creating a welcoming community is so important. Um, the Recurse Center slash formerly Hacker School social rules are great rules uh, slash guidelines to follow. Um, I also encourage you to just generally, um, generally to uh, embrace your inner newcomer. Um, be honest about the fact that you don't know everything, because you don't. Um, and when you make mistakes, when you uh, learn something new, be, be vocal about it so people can see you as someone who's in this process together with them. Uh, we have a project called Merge Stories. Uh, it's accounts of people's contributions to open source. Uh, this is a merge story from Julia Evans. Um, and uh, it's a great story. It's maybe my favorite. Apologies to everyone else. It's better than the ones that I have in there. Um, and it's just about going to a sprint, um, trying really hard, and not, not achieving the goal that she wanted to achieve, uh, which totally happens all the time in life and in open source. Um, and being explicit about that helps people to realize when they, get, when they enter a community and they're struggling that that's just a very natural, a very natural process. So takeaways. Explicit is better than implicit. Uh, that's true in communities as well as in code. Um, the more you can verbalize um, what you're looking for, what you expect of other people, um, what you plan to do, the better. Um, and then you won't have miscommunications uh, and people won't feel uh, ignored or excluded um, as much. 
Um, having preferences is great. It is preferable. Um, the more, pre well, within reason, but the more preferences you have, the better, because it helps you identify uh, situations, projects that are a better match for you. Confusion and frustration are natural, and they lead to great learning experiences um, if you can approach them in the right way. Uh, so what's next? Uh, on Sunday evening, I'm going to be running an Intro to the Sprints workshop. Uh, you must register to attend this workshop. Um, so if you're interested, there's a link. Uh, that blue newcomer workshop is a link. Um, there are a few open slots left. Um, if you get to a wait list, please sign up, because presumably some of the people will not be coming. And it's also, if there's a wait list that, and you don't get in, that's an indication of interest for next year, so we can get ourselves maybe a bigger room. Um, you can also come by the open hatch booth. If you enter the expo hall, it's all the way in the right-hand corner. Um, and rather than do a hallway track, because I'm really hungry and I want to go eat lunch at the end of this talk, I'm, we're going to be doing like a lunch track. So there's a bunch of uh, lunch tables near the open hatch booth. So when you find the open hatch booth, there'll be someone there or a sign there that can point you to where we're at the tables eating, and you can come talk more about open source and getting involved. Uh, I also have a bunch of links here from projects that I've mentioned, including contact info, both for Open Hatch and for myself. Um, I also wanted to give, uh, say a couple of thank yous uh, to the Open Hatch community generally. There's just a wonderful collection of uh, passionate volunteers. Um, to the Boston Python user group uh, and Ned, uh, who's done a lot of work in getting us ready for PyCon. Um, uh, to Elena Williams, uh, she gave a talk on getting started with open source last year. And I attended that talk and thought, oh, I could give that talk. Um, so if there's anyone here in the audience who is having a sort of similar feeling of, oh, I, I could give a talk on that, please reach out to me and reach out to Elena, because we're more than happy to work with you on you know, submitting a talk proposal on this topic for next year. Um, thanks to the example projects uh, that I mentioned. Um, and thanks to you, the audience, for sitting patiently through this, through this talk, uh, image credits, Back to important things. Excellent. I think I finished a little bit ahead of time, so we have time for Q&A. Uh, great. Thank you so much, Shauna. That was really fantastic. So if anyone's got any questions, and as I said, we'll continue the conversation. Once the questions here are finished, the conversation will continue after lunch at the Open Hatch booth. During lunch. And also during after lunch. lunch, if it's a great conversation. <laughs> I'm up for it. Well, after you've picked up lunch, I, I guess. Oh, yeah, after you've picked up lunch, but maybe while you're eating it. All right, I have a, a question. You very much stressed uh, being welcoming to newcomers in the communities. What advice do you have to other community members who are well aware of certain trolls? This kind of harkens back to the morning talk, but certain trolls that may exist in your community. We, I, we typically tell you know, people, ignore the trolls, don't feed the trolls, but I don't think that's constructive enough advice for us to give to newcomers. There needs to be something more we can do to help them avoid pitfalls or fall into feeling like they've been rejected by someone who, which maybe is just a known troublemaker in the community. Yeah, um, well, so, so if you have a known troublemaker in the community, presumably there's a reason why things haven't been more why they're still in the community or why they're still enacting that behavior in the community. So I'll leave aside how you can get them to stop behavior and focus on the right. interaction That's with the newcomer. Topic, um, uh, I think making it clear to the newcomer that this is something the person always does, that however they respond to it is OK. Um, and if they want to continue in the community, that's great. And you can, uh, you know, you'll be happy to help talk to them but that if they want to leave the community because this trollish behavior um, it makes them uncomfortable, that there's nothing wrong with that, and you won't hold it against them, and it doesn't make them like less than to leave. Um, I would also say speaking up publicly uh, against the trollish behavior is important, and not just quietly um, through back channels, because it makes it clear that not to the not just to the person that. Uh, to the newcomer that you care about this issue, but to the whole community mm. that, that you have a problem with the behavior. Uh, hi. Um, so I'm a uh, technology and programming teacher at high school. 
And I've considered giving a you know real GitHub project like assignment where you have to do like a request and get it approved. Um, but I have some serious reservations about doing that because not every student in my class is really that great or even cares. Uh, so there will be bad requests. There will be just like you know someone added a comment with one word, and I don't want to like annoy a community with this. And so I've I've you know always just done like a mock fake project, but there's the downfall of that is they don't feel like it's a real thing because it's not. Um, and I'm just like wondering if you have any thoughts on that or how to how to approach that without honestly just bugging the open source community. Well, it sounds to me like what you really want to do is find a project who is willing to take the bad with the good there um, and not unleash them on random projects. Um, I mean, so projects. Projects deal with um, both bad faith community, like um, new members, as well as uh, people, things just not working out. Um, so it's not that projects are these like fragile snowflakes that need to be protected. But at the same time, um, if you know that this is potentially going to be an issue, you can find a project, either a smaller project that's really excited about uh, working with you, or larger projects, for instance, things like um, Wikimedia, Mozilla, like these large projects have plenty of people who are actively dedicated to community outreach. Um, and so talking with them about um, uh, how they want to handle this issue, what kind of uh, projects people could work on could be really beneficial. OK. All right, thanks. And not all the students are weak. Some of them are <laughs> very capable, uh, by the way. <laughs> thanks. Well, thank you very much, Shauna. And um, I think it's lunchtime now, so another hand for Shauna. Great talk. <laughs>